Hello and welcome to Comic Books and You. Today we are going to cover Soda Issue 3, which is Tu ne buteras point, Thou shalt not kill, with an extra helping of uh, slang mixed to it. Soda uh, is a cop in New York City in the 1980s that has to pretend he's a pastor for his mother since uh, she has a weak heart and she wouldn't want him to be in the police since her husband died uh, serving back in the days in Arizona. And uh, this is a fairly typical story for Soda, which in turn works uh, fairly well as an introduction to the character, even if you didn't see the previous issues, which uh, we've already covered one of uh, in a previous video. So our main character is still living his double life here, uh, and that gets him in a bit of a pickle this time around. He's still terrified that his mother would find out about his current job, and we in it's actually in this book that we learn that his father was a cop in Arizona and that he died in service. So that kind of explains why he doesn't want to tell his mother that he is a police officer. He still has a problem with authority, even with the new captain that is uh, quite a lot more accommodating than he was before. New captain that also loves animal. Every issue <laughs> we see him, there's different animals around. Turtles, cats, tarantulas, you name it. So the, the captain is not a super important character. But as a background character, he is funny to have in this whole gimmick here. This is a case where the consequences of his own action come and bite him back really quickly and really hard. Another character here that is fairly important is Babs, who's a smart and street smart cop from Russia, or Russian origin at least. Might be Ukrainian, actually. I'm not quite sure. He's a very good friend with Soda and generally is the one that serves as his cover uh, when he has to call, the police has to call home to his mother, pretending that he's a member of the uh, Salvation Army. He's better at intelligence gathering and uh, dispatching and computer science-y stuff than the other uh, characters are, which is fun to see as we finally have a uh, computer-savvy person that is not a uh, smart-talking black woman. You know, what we see all the time in modern media. He does have a few weaknesses. He is a, a bit of a philanderer. That's a recurring team with Babs throughout the entire uh, series. And that usually gets him in trouble, <laughs> both at work and with his friends. Our third character, and that's another one that's recurring throughout the Soda series, is Linda Tchaikovsky. Because a black woman cop in New York called Tchaikovsky makes perfect sense. <laughs> She's very seductive. She's popular with the male officer, but she does seem to have a crush on Soda. She's an half-decent shot, half-decent driver. Overall, a good police officer that has a good moral center, at least as far as this entire series goes. Our last important character in this story is Father McIntyre, who's uh, Soda's uncle, who helped raise him in Arizona. He's extremely pious but he's somewhat naive overall that we see through this story he does have a uh, strong moral center like most of the good characters in this story and like most of the characters in the story he does have a uh, darker side or another side to him he d is in a very good shape for his age because he is probably in his 60s maybe 70s he's also a skilled boxer our story begins as Father McIntyre is coming into New York by bus, and he starts walking into what is called the modern Sodom and Gomorrah, and he meets with a few interesting characters <laughs> on the way already as he goes and visit his uh, sister, Mary, who is Soda's mother. On Soda's side, he uh, meets up with Tchaikovsky on the street after she actually directs McIntyre to his place uh, with Agent Van Beethoven in the car, a uh, Vietnamese cop. <laughs> so they have a quick chat and they go back to the police station where the new police chief, the beat, because he's a diabetes, starts berating him for missing some uh, practice, uh, shooting practice. And the fact that he's using a, a massive and cannon rather than a regulatory pistol for the for the police. We also see the turtle eating the report <laughs> at the bottom there. So it goes back home after uh, doing pretty good at shooting practice. He gets changed into his priest attire in the elevator going up, and he's greeted by his mother and father McIntyre, which makes Soda a little bit nervous about his double life, mainly because father McIntyre wants to go and visit Soda's chapel fairly quickly. Soda arranges something with Babs to get, you know, 10 fake churchgoers, a chapels for a service, 
something really quick. All the while, uh, Babs is currently uh, philandering, let's say. <laughs> the next morning, Babs basically goes to the uh, office and uh, try to recruit a bunch of police officers to help him out uh, with uh, the part of playing for chur churchgoers. But uh, unfortunately, they're called in for an hostage crisis, so they can't really uh, come and help. Luckily for him, there's a prison truck that's filled with 10, you know, basic prisoners here that are in transit. They're stuck at the station because the prison that would receive them is not letting anyone in for now. Bab sees this as an opportunity, signs off on them, and uh, gets them going. They get to the chapel, and Tchaikovsky is uh, left in charge of the whole operation as Babs has to go home uh, before his wife gets home. And she has to lightly discipline a few of them <laughs> before Professor, uh, before Father McIntyre and Soda show up. McIntyre gives a sermon on violence and that, that only fate can save you. But one of the criminal grabs Tchaikovsky and her gun and takes everybody hostage. Father McIntyre, as a good Christian would, decides to take Linda's place as the hostage while Tyrone uh, threatens all of them and uh, says that he's going to shoot everybody. Things do calm down a little bit and the criminals run away with McIntyre as the hostage while Linda and uh, Soda are tied up to be rescued by the actual pastor of the chapel who uh, comes out performing the sin of gluttony. Yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> Maybe he's a real American. He just likes burgers, something like that. <laughs> the two of them get rescued and Soda calls Babs for an update. Uh, his wife came home early, so he's in a bit of a in a bit of trouble. <laughs> but they decided they've got 18 hours to recover all of the criminals and Linda's handgun, which could be a pretty big problem if uh, it actually was lost. And they decide to end to the Bronx. When they get there, uh, they do interrogate and talk to a, a variety of people, including someone that is uh, perfectly sane of mind, saying Madonna for president. <laughs> But they find the police van in a pretty poor shape, even though it wasn't abandoned for very long. And uh, they find a petty criminal, Max, dressed up as a nun, that is stealing the truck's wheels. Looks like someone was stealing the bench from the truck as well there. <laughs> in exchange for said wheels, Max promises that he'll give Soda some information and probably not get arrested. Max is a petty criminal, but Soda knows that he's got a good core overall because he's been doing a few uh, good deeds on the side. And Max directs our heroes to a gang called the Black Muslims, who are residing in a local dump. At said dump, McIntyre was basically dumped there by the, uh, the, the criminals. And uh, he is introduced to the Black Muslims, uh, saying, is there no uh, good Christian soul to save me? So the, the, the black Muslims uh, declare jihad as Soda shows up asking them to stand down. Things degenerate a little bit and there is a, a small bit of a shootout. Soda hands his pistol to Tchaikovsky before he goes around and intercepts the Iman, who he recognized as a con artist that was saying he was a rabbi just a little bit earlier in the year. Sounds like a great people overall. The, the Iman has a, a change of heart and tells his people that they will do uh, peaceful protests going forward and over all of their guns. <laughs> and they rescue Father McIntyre. McIntyre explains what happened when he was in the van and says a, uh, a little story that the uh, prisoners were talking about. He misunderstands most of it, but uh, does say that uh, they were going to a place called Murphs. And Max, once again comes up and says, yeah, I know what Murph's is. It's a local bar. We are then brought in to Murph's where uh, the bandits are interrogating the local bar owner and reveal his vault where they are keeping a shared loot from a bank wagon. All four of them, including the, the bar owner, robbed a few days earlier. They also uh, spilled something on the, the carpet covering the, the vault here, reminding us of Big Lebowski. That's not the only movie this reminds me of, even though I think this comic would predate both Big Lebowski and <laughs> Pulp Fiction. But uh, th this is what this particular scene reminded me of uh, as poor Brett got shot in uh, Pulp Fiction. Here, poor Murph gets shot by the bandits. As this is all going on, Soda calls his mom to uh, tell her they'll be late. Uh, something came up. Then they call Babs calling for backup. All that using a payphone. Do you remember payphones? 
Incredible. <laughs> Our heroes go in the bar, and it's a very cheerful location, as you can see uh, from the art in the bottom there. Uh, currently playing uh, Frankie goes to Hollywood at the same time. Uh, unfortunately, they're quickly found out because uh, McIntyre kind of sticks out like a sore thumb in this uh, very cheerful location. And as that happens, the other members of the gang that are downstairs run upstairs to warn the others that were in the office, only to find out that they're gone and they ran out with the money. It doesn't take too long that all of them are arrested. Max helping out, as you can see, uh, with uh, some of the hand guns they uh, recovered from the black Muslims. They arrest the uh, owner as well, as he was uh, wearing a pair of a bulletproof vest to protect himself, since this is the oddest location in the Bronx. And uh, basically everybody that was, uh, except for the last three, are uh, arrested back. The last three bandits steal Babs' car after one of them pretends uh, he's on the floor there. Babs gets carjacked. Soda goes to intercept them after uh, they do shoot on Babs. And uh, McIntyre jumps into Soda's Volkswagen Beetle to go in pursuit as well. Soda shoots out the bandit's car, heavily damaging it. And uh, then he does some pretty fancy acrobatics, jumping over the car, as you see here in this panel. And Fodder McIntyre goes around the corner and intercepts the car as well, with a uh, pretty uh, bad result overall. You can see Babs is still alive, even though he was shot at. Tyrone's the only criminal in the bunch that's still up and running. He tries to take McIntyre hostage, but at that point, uh, I think uh, McIntyre has had enough, and he disarms him <laughs> and uh, punches him out quite heavily, punches the devil out of him, as uh, one Bob Ross would say, and Soda has to calm him down before he uh, does something they would regret. The rest of the police force shows up, arrest everyone they even try to arrest mcintyre before soda intervenes and reveals that he is really a cop as the whole thing is uh <laughs> turning down soda decides to go spend the night at tchaikovsky's uh, before going back to the office he has a, a small wound on his head from uh, being shot and just grazing his forehead and uh max as you can see at the bottom right is uh, asking for charity in his nurse outfit <laughs> And the next day, they uh, go back in. Everybody's ready for uh, being arrested. And Murph is getting interrogated for the uh, bank wagon iced. After the day and after talking to the captain, once again, Soda goes back home. He's ready to admit to his mother what his real day job is. But Father McIntyre already created an alibi for him as a little white lie. To keep his sister safe. And our story ends. There's a lot of things going on in this story. And it keeps accelerating. We'll talk about that more when we go over into pacing. It works really, really well. As an introductory story to Soda. If you just started reading it. This would be a great book to start at. It has very nice characters. And a few other things going on at the same time. We do have a shift in the artist as well. Uh, Luc Warin, who was doing the first two books, uh, was physically incapable of continuing to draw and the art job. So he uh, passed on the baton to Gazzotti, page 11 or so, and you can see a shift in the style at the time. We'll look about that more in a little bit as well. The cover for this book has not changed much between edition, title itself, and the uh, branding. Change location depending on which issue you're getting in terms of the edition. This is the latest one, the oversized format, which uh, comes in two packs, so they're fairly cheap overall, great value for money. It's really weird to see a priest with a pistol <laughs> and a, a gun range with another priest on it. It's different. It attracts the eye. The reflection in Soda's glasses is also really good. This is an extremely powerful cover overall. Basically, the original had the branding at the bottom rather than at the top. The title was in the image rather than outside of it. It's not really a huge difference, whichever book you get. There's one version, however, that's a black and white edition, which is a black background, soda in blood red with that blood red. I thought it was smears at first. Looking closely, it's more like little leaves and things like that around it. It looks bloody awesome, <laughs> honestly. 
but I think those are fairly rare. I've never seen one in the wild. The branding is fairly strong on the cover. Uh, it's rather effective. Looks like fancy typewriter script from the era of the comic. Oversized book that I have. It doesn't quite fit well in my bookshelf compared to the, my other bande dessinée, but it's still very good looking overall. The quality on of the binding on these books look a lot better than the one I had on the previous run. Not sure if I just got a bad book or something weird happened and I didn't notice it. I don't don't know. I'm not sure. Those look fairly good overall. There's a title page in the book uh, that is also pretty awesome here with Father McIntyre in the bus bla uh, with black, red, and white. Looks very uh, interesting and Fairly strong as far as an image goes. Pretty impressed with that overall. Our back cover is uh, the Soda Introduction, which I've read in uh, video number one, uh, is basic tagline, and the also in this collection at the bottom. There's an extra book now in there, but from a different author, so they basically are using a second uh, back cover for that particular book, Le Pasteur Sanglin, which came out this year. As he was working on this particular volume of soda, uh, Luc Warren basically had a nervous breakdown combined with a physical breakdown. So he wasn't able to complete the work on the book. He sold his part of the work basically to uh, Bruno Gazzotti, who's another artist that was under the Dupuis labels, basically semi-retired. You can look up his history. He went into and started doing uh, super anime, super Mario animation and clay animation, it, including it in comic books. So he did still do all sorts of creative work, but the actual work of drawing he stopped doing. You see a transition in the art style in this particular book. The style before with Waran is a little bit more closer to Spirou and uh, Petit Spirou, like he was working on before. And then when it switches to Gazzotti, the style sort of remains the same, but you have a bit of sharper edges on many of the characters, and it looks a little bit less cartoony while still keeping exaggerated features. I mean, Gazzotti tried his best to keep Waran's style, but overall, this is the style that will define Soda in the future, and he's still working on the new. Uh, volumes with the new author it's still fairly realistic but it also exaggerates features that need to be exaggerated and we have all sorts of things here we've got a good change in babs here uh, if you look here very rounded figure something that you would see a lot more in spirou at least in that particular time frame and with gazotzi you've got he's less rounded you've got more marks on the face it's a transfer of style at least for that character it's one that's easy to realize that there's a difference uh, Gazzotti basically doesn't give a hoot in this particular book uh, anything that you see in there would probably get you canceled nowadays and would probably have a whole lot of people up in arms Gazzotti just doesn't care here which is really great of course we have to think that this was done in the mid 80s so it's a different era, <laughs> let's face it, but it is a very nice to see overall. The uh, celebratory bar scene is uh, very over the top if you go through it, let's say. The characters are beautifully done throughout this, whether by either of the artists, but you do see a difference, like I said. And without a care in the world, you've got extreme violence in this book, which is more or less targeted to kids. You think about it through Dupuis in Magazine Spirou. If you want more mature stuff, normally you'd go in Magazine Tintin. So interesting to see here as a, a bit of a difference compared to the standard Dupuis fair. Backgrounds to art are beautifully done. And uh, whenever you're in daytime, the panels are orangish, glowy kind of color, which I think would be made to represent the smog and the pollution in New York's air compared to a clear blue sky. I'm not sure if that was really what was intended, but this is how I see this particular uh, kind of art here. The cars that we see throughout this are generally pretty good. Not top of the line. I've seen better, especially if we look at like Yuko Tsuno and a few of those, obviously. But they are up there in terms of quality 
of the mechanical designs. Same thing with the guns. It's not top of the line, not perfect replica, but it's great for what we're dealing with and better than what you see in many French bande dessinée where they sometimes just go extremely caricatural on the pistols. One thing you do notice, though, uh, all, all of those uh, black Muslim gangbangers, uh, they all hold their, their guns fairly correctly, so it's not a perfect representation of 1980s black culture in New York. Maybe a little bit more <laughs> research would have been needed there. I'm just kidding, obviously. Panel work is extremely basic overall, which is an expectation when we're dealing with bande dessinée. They don't do the uh, extremely strong paneling that we have in American comics. And for something that came out in the 1980s, it's not as good as it could have been. Honestly, there is a superior, even in bande dessinée, work of panels. They work for what they're supposed to do, but not the best. Funnily enough, this is the only book in the Soda series where nobody actually dies. With a title like Thou Shall Not Kill, it's actually pretty fun here as a play on the title and the words here. There's still plenty of gunfight, car crashes, people getting shot, uh, people getting er busted up. But I think the author really wanted to do a bit of something else compared to the other books that he had already written. And it is fairly different from the other books that come later in the series as well. Throughout this issue, also, uh, Soda is not using his trademark Colt Python. He basically uses a police-issued 9mm. It might explain the lower body count, <laughs> but I don't think uh, it, it does a huge difference. It's just a, a, something that's different here about this book. The main theme throughout the book is that living a double life is difficult and uh, not something that you can... Uh, run away from all the time and this is a thing that is ongoing with pretty much every character in the book except for mary soda's mom who's just a nice little old woman babs has all of his infidelity soda has his pastor versus police life uh, tchaikovsky desires to get closer to soda even though she's uh, working with him you have the same thing with murphy in the that owns a bar but is also a criminal doing uh, nasty things Every character is just uh, as uh, multiple layers to them. We don't see him for very long, but uh, there's that Vietnamese agent, Van Beethoven, <laughs> that's in there as well. Very fun parody, and he's the one that brings up that a, a black woman cop called Tchaikovsky is weird. That's all part of the jokes. We have Max, the Bronx informant slash career criminal. That's a funny parody as well to try to show that some criminals have a good art. I mean, he... Uh, is doing petty crimes and uh, causing a bit of a ruckus, but he's trying to raise two kids. He's taking care of a prostitute that he got off the street. While he's not super clean, let's say, he does trying to get a bit cleaner at the same time. Another character with a bit of a double life. You have the scam artist taking advantage of unattached black people in New York and Jews earlier, if we're just thinking that he was a... a pretending to be a rabbi for a while. This might hit closer to Ohm than we would want right now. Let's uh, not dwell on this for too long. We, this is a book where we're nowhere near modern sensibilities. We have organic diversity in New York police. We have organic diversity in the criminals. If you look, the criminal gang is all sorts of people, not a uh, specific subtype. We have a random gay bar scene because... It just makes for a great scene with a pastor and police and everything involved. Everything is over the top. Everything is pushed up to 11. And I think that's what makes this book truly entertaining. We're also not shown the police being hyper-competent and magical, like in many of the modern police procedurals. And we're not seeing them as downright evil and corrupt, like one of, in one of Director X's Rob Yin Yud uh, super TV show. The police is the police. They do what they're supposed to do. They make mistakes. And they uh, fix their mistakes when they can. The Bronx is shown as a crime-riddled and awful place, which is really not far from the truth in the 80s and probably not very far from the truth today either, unfortunately. This is a book that's extremely masculine in terms of the energy of the characters and the energy of everything that is going on. 
when McIntyre flips into go mode as he's pushed to the limit there and uh, someone threatens his nephew, this is probably one of the most masculine thing I have read in a little while. Surprisingly, because I did read a few uh, pretty good comics recently. But here, even the feminine energy that we have from Linda Tchaikovsky is there to supplement the masculine energy. She is meant to be a beautiful woman. She is meant to be attractive and bring that energy to the table. As far as the pacing of this story goes, it is pretty much like most soda books that I've gone through. It starts relatively relaxed. Not much is going on and we're just eased into the story. And it progressively gets faster and faster and faster with a powerful action-packed ending and explosive resolution. We don't get to spend a lot of time in the book here just giving character introductions or history or backgrounds. We get what's necessary for the story and that's all you need. In a book like this from Japan, we'd probably get one chapter for Linda, one chapter for Babs, We'd probably get a whole chapter of Soda getting berated by the captain, and it would uh, end up degenerating like this over time with more and more chapters. Not a bad thing. Of course, it's a completely different style when you're dealing with manga and you have to release something every week. So that's why those are very character-driven stories. If you were dealing with an American comic, well, you'd have exposition dumps all the fucking time, and you'd have people uh, eating... Uh, lunch around the table and uh, talking about their feelings oh wait no that's only in modern comics <laughs> but you do notice here the very big difference even in american comics people would expect to have that exposition dump for each of the characters unlike some of the other soda books we don't get a fantastic payoff at the end of this one there's an organic progression in the story and it ends well with soda keeping his secret identity and things having been resolved. But if you compare it to some of the other books, and we'll probably see Soda 4 later on uh, this month or later on period, you'll see that the payoffs at the end of some of those stories are extremely rewarding. As the first real collaboration between uh, Tom and uh, Gazotti, this is a really strong entry in the world of Bande dessinée, even under a more kid-friendly brand like Dupuis. I'm generally one to say that comics should be for 7 to 77, and this really one really hits the mark really well. It has plenty of action, violence, it has the sexy that is needed, but you've got nothing that makes you jump out and clutch your pearls. Everything's worked out as a parody, even when we're dealing with real-life events or real-style event. The fact that the story takes place in the 1980s New York really gives us a tightlessness that no modern comic as whenever they date themselves, especially with things like electronic device and all sorts of uh, weird political leaning and things like this. This story could take place, of course the cars date it a little bit, but you could take the exact same story from the 1950s all the way to now. The technology would be a little bit different, but it would still be very timeless. If you can find those books, I would recommend giving them a try. Uh, they're available in two packs for issues one through six. So you get one, two, three, four, five, six in two packs at half the price. Basically, a price of one book for two. Really reasonable. They're those oversized books, so some people might like them, some people might not. It's really up to you. We don't see any real issue with the art, even though it's blown up by about, I'd say, 20%. So they're really worth getting just for the art in a way. If you can get a translation of it, if you're English only, good as well. If you're learning French or want to learn French to get into Bande dessinée, they're not bad books either. They're not super complex or weird. So this is a very strong recommend for me. I hope you guys have a very nice rest of your day. I thank you very much for listening to me for so long. Keep on reading comics. Keep on enjoying them. I'll keep reviewing and analyzing them. And I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.